Okay. So again, my name is Marat Fine. I'm the Program Manager here at the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm joined today uh, by phone and by Internet with Georgette Bennett and with Shadi Martini. Shadi Martini is a, uh, a refugee and an activist and an advocate. Uh, he's been working with the MFA, the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees. He's going to speak to us about his experience. And uh, Dr. Georgia Bennett is a great um, member of JFN. And she's the president of the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding and is a sociologist and has been also working very closely with the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees. Um, and she founded it, in fact, in 2013. So this is a very important topic to her heart and to all of ours, and we're going to learn more about what has been happening, how as philanthropists as, and as Jewish philanthropists uh, we can be involved and help. Um, and of course, you know, at JFN we're really committed to um, a set of values, and among those is of course tikkun olam, repairing the world, and there is, this is 100% in line with that, figuring out how as philanthropists, as Jewish philanthropists, as members of humanity, we can um, move forward and, uh, and fix this or help to fix this. So just give me one moment. I'm going to be muting everyone, and then I'll be unmuting those of you who are speaking. So just bear with me. The conference has been muted. All right. So now we have um, both Shadi and Georgette have been unmuted, and without further ado, I will let you take it away. Georgette? Thank you very much, Marav, and thank you to all of you for your interest. Uh, some of you are um, coming into contact with uh, the work that uh, we're going to be describing uh, for the first time, and others of you who are on the phone, um, I know have attended previous sessions with us, and, and some have even provided very important support for the work. So I thank you for that. Um, the way that we're going to structure this presentation is to give you first an overview of, um, of what the situation is. Um, we're then going to be talking about um, what's going on in the U.S. in terms of resettlement, what's going on in Europe. Um, we're going to be giving you some information about a very interesting uh, development that has come out of the humanitarian work, um, speak to you about what we think is a realistic um, agenda for things that need to be done and where we think philanthropic dollars can make a difference. So let me start first just by updating you on the crisis in numbers. Uh, those of you who are on your computers uh, will see that we've put some numbers up there in terms of what is happening in Syria, there are 310,000 who have been killed. The lifespan in Syria has dropped 30% uh, from an average, uh, an expected lifespan of 80 to 56. 80% uh, of Syria has fallen into poverty. It has dropped way down on the World Development Index. It's, it's pretty close to the bottom now. Within Syria, there are more than 12 million who have been displaced or are under siege. Uh, all are, un are in urgent need of aid. We know about 4 million refugees. Those are the ones who were registered. There are hundreds and thousands of others who were not registered. And that has a whole lot of implications in terms of access to services, in terms of qualifications for resettlement. Most of the refugees right now are in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey, although almost everything that you're hearing about right now is the flood of refugees who are in Europe. Now, as uh, Shadi will tell you, they've been going into Europe for quite a while, but it took the, that image, that horrific image of the Syrian toddler washed up on a beach 
in Turkey to suddenly galvanize the world. And that's one of the reasons that so much attention is now being paid to Europe. But we shouldn't forget that relatively few refugees are in Europe. That's not where the biggest problem is. 80% of the refugees are not in camps where they at least have access to a modicum of services. 80% of them are in effect squatters. Uh, they're called urban refugees and they're just finding housing where they can, surviving as they can, um, and very, very vulnerable. Also very vulnerable are women and children who make up 80% of the population of refugees. Now, you would never know that when you look at the images of the refugees who were flooding into Europe. And if you saw today's New York Times, you would have seen an article which said that 69% of those who were going to Europe are young men. And um, unfortunately, that creates the impression that you have young, strong people who make up the majority of refugees. But in fact, what it really means is that the most vulnerable refugees are being left behind because, of course, the ones who can undertake this dangerous voyage are not the most vulnerable ones. They're the strongest ones, and it's an expensive voyage, which also means that it's likely that they have more resources than the ones who are being left behind, and Shadi will be able to expand on that as well. So that's, that's an overview of... Um, of the crisis in numbers. Now, UNHCR is the UN agency that is charged with running the refugee camps, um, with registering the refugees, with providing direct services, with reaching out to the most vulnerable refugees in order to register them and get them ready for resettlement. Uh, UNHCR tries very hard, but it's completely overwhelmed by now. Um, for one thing, there's a 60% funding gap in the $1.5 billion that they need to get through this year. Um, the collapse of the euro has contributed to the faltering finances of uh, UNHCR. And so they're not in a position now where they're able to reach out to the most vulnerable refugees, because the most vulnerable refugees are the ones who are the least likely to present themselves. And that's for a range of cultural reasons, um, including uh, shame. Many of the women have been victims of gender violence. Um, some of it has to do with illiteracy, not being able to manage the forms. So these are refugees who really need to be found because they're not likely to present themselves. Now, UNHCR is also the most important source of referrals for resettlement. And for quite a while, UNHCR was not able to get enough uh, refugees into the pipeline for resettlement. That's not true right now. Uh, right now, uh, UNHCR is actually a little bit ahead of the game, and they now have 20,000 refugees uh, earmarked for referral to the United States. The question is whether um, the United States is in a position to resettle them. Now, as you can see on this next slide, there are more than 300,000 Syrian applications for asylum in Europe. <clears throat> UNHCR <clears throat> excuse me, has requested of the worldwide community that 130,000 be resettled. And um, the latest information that I have from UNHCR is that there are places that have been identified for all of these, but that doesn't mean that they have, in fact, been moved to their new host countries. In fact, very few of them have been moved. 
and in the U.S., only 249 refugees have been resettled in the last year and only about 1,500 since this conflict started. Uh, conflict is now uh, going into its fifth year. In Europe, um, there are somewhere between 850,000 and a million refugees who are expected this year. About 400,000 have already crossed into Europe, and about 3,000 have died trying to cross. The European Union wants to resettle um, about 160,000 over a two-year period. That's the EU commitment, which is different from the commitment of individual member states. Germany, as we've all heard, has offered to resettle 800,000, and as of August, 145,000 uh, Syrian refugees have already arrived in Germany. Um, various EU countries have offered to resettle um, uh, varying numbers, 20,000 over five years, 24,000 over two years. Sweden is offering permanent residency, and today the first group of 20 Syrian refugees is, uh, is being transferred to Sweden. So that, that's just an overview in numbers in terms of Europe. And what I'm going to do now is, is turn it over to Shadi, who is in Europe right now, and he can give you a report from the field. After Shadi finishes doing that, I'll come back to talk to you in more depth about the situation in the U.S. and to also move on to the other parts of this issue that we're hoping to cover with you today. So, Shadi, please go ahead. Uh, hi, good evening in my part of the world. I hope, I think, good afternoon to you in the U.S. And uh, so uh, I'm going to give a brief uh, history of myself, how I became to uh, working with the Multiface Alliance and uh, doing what I'm doing now. I'm, my name is Shadi Martini. I'm from... Uh, Aleppo, uh, north of Syria, it's, uh, I guess, the largest city in Syria in terms of population. I was, uh, I was managing a hospital in Aleppo, and, uh, you know, uh, the uprising in, in Syria uh, made this uh, horrific uh, tragedy of people getting shot while they're demonstrating, so we had to react. We started helping the people who got uh, shot. That put us in uh, in odd with the government that didn't want uh, they wanted to get any treatment. Uh, so we continued uh, this work secretly until uh, mid 2012, where uh, our network was discovered. I was forced to flee into Turkey. From there, I went uh, to Bulgaria, where I started uh, continued my work providing humanitarian aid and. Uh, assistance to refugees and internally displaced uh, people, or IDP, uh, in Syria. We, uh, talking about refugees, Shadi? Uh, yes? You cut out just for a second, so I don't know if you're on a, what, what kind um, of line you're on. Um, I'm using uh, the net. Okay. Okay. Well, you're back now. now. Anyway, carry on. Okay. Sorry about that. No, just, just tell me when I'm cut off, please. So uh, we were uh, uh, since uh, I was uh, stationed in Bulgaria, and in Tusa, uh, at the beginning there was not a lot of uh, influx in uh, refugees. The first year, 2011, 2012 was a little bit of refugees trying to cross into Europe, but we saw a major increase in number in 2013, and mainly the route that people were taking to go into Europe was through uh, Bulgaria and the, uh, it's the second Balkan route. The first one was Greece, but Greece at that time was increasing their security on their borders. They were um, harassing uh, people. They were sending them back to Turkey. 
and people weren't using the seas. So we had about, uh, in the span of three months in 2013, about 20,000 um, mainly Syrian refugees crossing into Bulgaria. Of course, Bulgaria is a very small country. They weren't uh, prepared for that, so it was a very big hardship for the refugees. It's uh, a poor country, doesn't offer a safety net for them, and most of the people really didn't want to stay in Bulgaria. They just thought that they could cross through and go to other Western European countries, and the main target was Germany because of its... Uh, Social, uh, social, you know, system for refugees, the benefits that they get, the medical care that they get. So people thought that they could get, uh, uh, you know, better treatment in their end care. So, but they were stuck there because the uh, the Dublin regulations states that when you go into one European country and uh, you're registered there, you have to stay there. Of course, in 2014, uh, it was. Uh, there was a lull uh, of the uh, refugee situation. Bulgaria enforced uh, a lot of restrictions. Greece, the same thing. Then came 2015. What uh, we saw is a big increase due to the situation in Greece, where you had uh, political turmoil and economical turmoil, and the ability to cross the waters from Turkey to Greece. And Greece was allowing refugees to just pass through it to go to Macedonia and then to uh, Serbia and from there to Hungary and to Germany, their final destination. Uh, so uh, what happened really, and uh, regarding these images that I'm seeing that a lot of men are there, the big number of there. So I want to make some remarks regarding Syrian refugees especially. Uh, uh, according to the European information for uh, last year, and I'm talking from June, 2014 to June 2015. Actually, the first asylum seekers who were sought asylum in the European Union, Syrians are only 21% of the total number of asylum seekers over there. After that are uh, uh, citizens of Afghanistan, then Albania, and there's a big increase from uh, refugees from Iraq. But in the last uh, two, three months, of course, the situation is a little bit different. The main route for going into Europe is the road through the uh, western coast of Turkey, going into Greece, the islands uh, across uh, from the Turkish shore, and then going to the mainland in Greece. And over that span, uh, we, we had mission on the Greek Macedonian border. So we did some analysis and uh, since we are Syrians and we, we know the difference between, uh, in Arabic, you need to know the difference in, uh, in, the, in the accent to know uh, which person in which Arabic country. So if you're a Syrian, you're identified this person as an Iraqi, even though he saves from Syrian. So the problem is a lot of people are saying that they are Syrians. So our information told us and the people we saw, we saw that about only 40% of people crossing actually are Syrians. Uh, the rest are not, but they're getting uh, you know, fake IDs and fake passports to state that they are Syrians because they believe that they can get asylum much faster and much easier because of the situation in Syria. And mainly this segment of population, especially from Iraq and from Afghanistan, they, uh, because of the long trip from Afghanistan, mainly they are men crossing. Of course, there are some families, but most are men. And Iraq also mainly are men. In Syria, you have an increase of men due to one reason, and that is uh, uh, youngsters who are um, getting into the age of the draft in Syria. They have to go to the military. So a lot of them are fleeing the country because of going into the military. And the other segments are families who are main reason of going is that they can't take it anymore. And we noticed that most of these people crossing, and I can tell you the number if, you, if we're talking about August, September, uh, we noticed from this crossing point, and it was the main crossing point into Western Europe, uh, to Serbia and Hungary, about 4,000 people were crossing each day. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the families that are going, uh, coming from Syria, mainly they are fresh, you know, fresh coming out of the country. They weren't in refugee camps. 
Uh, a lot of them are telling us that they left Syria just in the last month, and the reason is that they just can't take it anymore of this, uh, the intense bombing campaign that is going on, and because of the shortage of electricity, water, food, supplies, and uh, you know, everything, they, they just, just can't work. Of course, some people are leaving from neighboring countries, but we noticed that a big increase from people leaving from inside Syria directly trying to make it into Europe. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the situation along the borders and how people are going. Now, we, we noticed some other things that we, uh, we, we saw that may give a lot of misinformation uh, when you do statistics. Um, because also of this ability of us to communicate with them because we are Syrians and we know, we know the situation and they can trust us. And uh, so a lot of people are stating the reason when someone is asking them, why are you leaving? And some, a lot of people are think that if they say I'm leaving because of ISIS, they will get asylum faster because of the sentiment in the West that ISIS is the biggest danger and, uh, and uh, ISIS uh, name in, uh, in the news. But actually, most of them that we talk to, when we talk in private to them, they say, well, really, we, we got out of the bombing because uh, the bombing campaign by the government. So um, this is giving misleading information to the public and to the people. But mainly these people are, go are fleeing because of the bombing campaign. We also noticed actually when we started registering people, you know, uh, Dr. Bennett talked about uh, life expectancy of people. We noticed their faces. You know, when we, when we talked to um, a woman who's coming out, we, so we saw a woman of 70 or 80. And when we started, and we, we started asking for their names, we will see them in the late 40s. So even faces of the people, you can see the struggle of the hardship that they've been living to. You, you, you see on their faces that they've aged 20, 30 years more than their actual age. So it's, it's taking a lot of toll on the people. We have an example of um, a newborn. We had a 15-day-old baby crossing. Uh, from uh, Greece to Macedonia, and they, he didn't eat for three days because his mother couldn't breastfeed him. So he, he was without food for three days. He went to our point at the border, and we we fed the baby so he can and gave them the ability to feed him so he continued his long trip. Until now, uh, the situation hasn't changed. People are crossing over. Until now, um, we had a problem. Uh, with the Hungary blocking the borders, then we had an issue that people were trying to find an alternative route, which was through Croatia and Slovenia. And the danger was there that we knew that there was a war, Bosnian war, so there was a lot of landmines. So, for instance, Multiface Alliance made an appeal that you know people need to have safe passage, or they will be you know subjected to another problem. And uh, luckily, after, uh, after that, the Hungarian authorities uh, reopened the border, and now they are being transformed and going into uh, Austria and then to Germany. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Hello. Shadi um, and your so, death. So a couple... Um, a couple of uh, other points to make about Europe. Um, as, as most of you are aware, most of, uh, most of the refugees are making landfall um, in Greece, the island of Lesbos, and the Libyan refugees are making landfall in, in Italy. Our focus here is Syrians, of course. But the irony here is that if you look at the Pew surveys that have been done, the countries where the Syrians are making landfall um, are countries that have the most negative views of Muslims. The countries that are willing to bring in the refugees, according to the Pew survey, have the least negative views about Muslims. So it's very important to find ways to get them out of the countries where the views are the most negative and get them into the countries that are willing to receive them. Now, that raises the whole issue of um, 
rescue rescue ships and airlifts. And as Shadi pointed out, <clears throat> the problem is that according to EU law, you um, you have to stay in the country where you're registered. That's number one. Number two, um, there there is carrier liability if you transfer refugees um, by plane who don't have a visa. Different EU countries interpret this differently, but it means that we are stuck with a situation in which, first of all, we have an instant replay of the Vietnamese boat people situation. Uh, Doctors Without Borders have three rescue ships operating in the Mediterranean. But to our knowledge, there are no rescue ships that are operating in the Aegean, which is where the Syrian refugees are crossing from Turkey um, into into Greece. Uh, Sweden, uh, a Swedish NGO, has started uh, an airlift with one plane. So this is an area that that really needs to be looked at. Turning now to the situation in the U.S., we've recently heard a lot of numbers being thrown around. Um, The U.S. will now admit 100,000 refugees, and 10,000 of those will be Syrian. Um, When you hear the 100,000, that does not refer as I, as, as I think is clear to Syrian refugees, it's total refugees. And that 10,000 happens to be a lower number than what the administration has committed to in earlier years. And in 2012, 2013, 2014, it, it committed to taking 12,000 in one year and 13,000 in another year. So the number has actually dropped. But none of the numbers mean anything if we are not able to relieve the bottleneck in our resettlement process. The UN, the US has um, a very stringent security clearance process. And we don't suggest for a moment that the U.S. should compromise its security criteria. But there are relatively easy fixes to make sure that the system operates more efficiently. Um, For one thing, Congress needs to allocate more funds in order to dedicate personnel to speeding up the screening process. As you've all heard, it now takes an average of 18 months um, for a refugee to be granted asylum in the U.S. And and for vulnerable refugees who need immediate assistance, that's simply, it's unacceptable. Number two, there are a number of agencies who are involved in the screening process but they don't operate with uniform protocols or using uniform algorithms. They all use different ones. And that, um, that greatly slows down the process. Number three, if we were to prioritize the most vulnerable refugees, meaning the women and children, then they, they really are the least security risks. So one could move that process along faster. And another population to target is the 15,000 medical workers, doctors, who have left Syria because medical attacks on medical facilities and medical workers have been used as a weapon of war in Syria. And um, Shadi could tell you some horrific stories about what has happened to those who did not flee Syria. But we have in the U.S. so many communities that are underserved in terms of having medical workers. And this would be an extraordinary win-win if we were to bring in more, more of the Syrian medical workers who have, who have fled Syria. 
Um, in addition to that, we have cities in the U.S. that have lost population and are in urgent need of being revitalized and repopulated. Cities like Pontiac, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, where there are already substantial Syrian populations in place that could ease the transition for the newcomers. The, the greatest needs um, of refugees, as they define it, I, I just today um, had a conversation with um, the, the head of the Migration Policy Institute that has done a lot of research in this field, is work and education. Work is very important in terms of integrating the young men, especially in Europe. And education is very important because we have an entire generation that has lost um, that has lost out on schooling. Um, so language education, remedial education, so that they will be able to catch up once they are settled again and can get back into school, these are very high priorities. There are just um, a couple of other things that um, I want to mention before we get into specifics about where can philanthropic dollars help, although I think you've already gotten clues from some of what Shadi and I have said about where philanthropic dollars can help. But for JFN, one of the things that has come out of the humanitarian aid that MFA has been doing is, and this is, this is really almost serendipitous, there are Israeli NGOs and Syrian NGOs that have actually been partnering in delivering humanitarian aid all over the region. And out of this has come a Syrian-Israeli engagement uh, which is something that we certainly want to encourage, a Syrian-Israeli engagement that is looking at a number of other avenues for partnership. And this is sowing the seeds for future stability in the region. So I just wanted to mention that because this is actually a unique aspect of the work that the Multi-Faith Alliance has been doing and so important in terms of seeing that it's possible, even for sworn enemies, to rise above politics and to rise above suspicion and misunderstanding and even hatred in order to work together to alleviate extraordinary human suffering. Now, in terms of areas where philanthropic dollars can make a difference, um, I, will, I will throw some out at you. I'm sure that Shadi will have some thoughts about where it can make a difference. But certainly education is a very important one. And um, as an example, um, I've just learned that the Jesuit colleges and universities have started a scholarship program um, to help Syrian students um, come to those colleges and universities to get tertiary education because this is something that's out of reach for so many Syrians. And um, the Polonsky Foundation, which happens to be uh, our family foundation, is starting a similar program in the UK. Um, Resettlement, very, very important. Um, the Jewish response has really been quite extraordinary. Um, once, once that toddler washed up on shore, we have gotten requests from major Jewish organizations to give them briefings on how they can help, JDC, UJA, the JFN 
uh, board and membership were there right at the beginning, and I have to say that the greatest support that we have received has been from JFN and its members. Many synagogues got in touch with us, um, and many um, and many people who want to offer homes, who want to offer jobs, who want to offer to help in any way that they can. Um, the Jewish Coalition uh, for Syrian Refugees, which is made up of something like 18 Jewish organizations and is co-chaired by JDC, has made allocations to a broad range of organizations, both Israeli organizations and Jewish organizations, and and non of uh, the the International Rescue Committee, uh, Jordanian Red Crescent, UNICEF. So there are many many ways in which philanthropic dollars can help, but we have to be very realistic and understand where the roadblocks are in terms of resettlement. And it would be very good to put some philanthropic dollars into advocacy so that we could relieve the roadblocks that are preventing resettlement in the U.S. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen just a few of the organizations um, with which the Multi-Faith Alliance has worked um, where you can donate. And they work on different aspects of the problem. Trauma treatment is extremely important because this is a highly trauma traumatized population. population. They cannot get on with their lives until the trauma is addressed. So the screen that you see now has a small sampling of Jewish and Israeli organizations. Israeli NGOs, a number of them, are operating all over the region, also um, in Greece right now um, and elsewhere. Um, the next screen I'm going to put up, which seems to have disappeared, um, is for other organizations. Here we go. Um, which are not Jewish and um, are not Israeli. And again, this is just a small sample. We can give you a long list of carefully vetted, reliable organizations. We've also taken the liberty of put the, putting the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees on that screen because the four aspects of our mission really go to the heart of um, many of the things that need to be done. Um, Shadi, do you want to mention any other areas where philanthropic dollars would be very, very useful strategically? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Well, well, you mentioned one uh, that is education that is uh, uh, very important for uh, for us. What we're facing in Syria is really a lost generation. Uh, we have a lot of um, areas uh, inside Syria and neighboring countries that we have a lot of uh, people that are, a lot of children especially, that are not getting education or a good quality education. And some of them have been targeted by groups who want to radicalize the, the young population of Syria, which is very uh, worrying for us. And this is why a lot of organizations that have uh, open schools in the area so uh, they can, uh, you know, give uh, an education uh, to these youngsters that is, uh, how to say, it, more compatible with, the, uh, I don't want to say Western, but like mainstream ideas and not to be radicalized, that to, to concentrate on education, on, the, on, on, on the science, math, and not on, uh, on the, the, the radical uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalist uh, teachings that some groups are trying to do. 
So it's it's really it's a battle for the future, and a lot of Syrians and Syrian organizations are trying to do their best because we feel that uh, radicalized population, in, in the first hand, it's a danger for for Syria and for Syrians, and of course it's a danger to the whole world. And another thing that we try to do is we try to um, give people the ability to sustain themselves. So uh, through open, opening of workshops and trying to uh, teaching them languages or uh, doing uh, continuing education so they can, uh, they can start over because a lot of them uh, could work in Syria but their diplomas or uh, couldn't uh, give them the ability to work in other countries and, uh, and not to mention that a lot of the neighboring countries doesn't allow the refugees to work. So it's a, it's a very tough situation when a person doesn't have work or his children are doesn't doesn't have education. So they are this is forcing a lot of people to make a very very tough decision, even risking their lives to go, to find these uh, things somewhere else or uh, going to uh, to more uh, radical organizations that are preying on the weak to uh, you know to make their their own agenda. So I really need to concentrate on education. Of course, you know, the medical field is also a very important one that we work on. That's also to giving the, the people out there a good, uh, you know, health service because that's another issue. A lot of people in Syria are not taking their medications. They have blood pressure. They have chronic diseases. They have diabetes. They can't afford even to take uh, medications. That's forcing a lot of... Uh, healthy men and women of not being able to work and that's also creating a big problem. So probably the is work, education and uh, health systems that's the most needed of uh, of let's say uh, investing and uh, in, in 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 their area around Syria and in Syria at the moment. Thank you. So before we, we open it up for questions, let me just say one word about Jewish values. When we first started doing this work um, more than two years ago now, um, we always had to kind of make a big point of how, as Jews, we are commanded to take care of the stranger. Uh, it is a core value of all the major religions, the notion of asylum. Um, we don't have to do that very much anymore because <laughs> I have to say people really get it. You know, we don't get any more questions about, well, why should we do this for Syrians? After all, they're the enemy. We don't hear that at all anywhere. Um, so these are human beings who are in desperate circumstances, and we are commanded to take care of them. So thank you for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Georgette, and um, thank you so much, Shadi. I'm going to unmute everyone's line. Uh, we have oh, a little over 10 minutes for, for questions, so feel free to say them. If you don't feel comfortable speaking them, you can go ahead and type them to me, and I will read them to the group. But right now I'm going to unmute the line and identify yourself if you're going to speak. Thanks. The conference has been unmuted. Is it something we said or didn't say? <laughs> Sometimes there are no questions. That's okay. It's a lot of information to take in. So I'm going to just give you guys a couple more seconds to decide if you have questions. Um, and if you don't, then that's okay. We will be posting this and sending out the recording along with a brief survey to let us know how we're doing. Um, could uh, could we ask um, the group um, whether we have addressed 
uh, or provided them with the kind of information that they need in order to do their own thinking about this. Meaning in the survey? Or just right on now? The call. No, 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 on, on the call. I just want to make sure that we've provided everybody with what they need and what they were looking for. Well, will I can't, we have access I can't. To, to the screens that show the organization? Excuse me? Um, Somebody was saying something about the screens that show the organizations. Hello? I think the person, if I don't know if the person's off, but I, I wanted to answer your question. I think the person was asking if we can get access to the information to the document that had the list of organizations if we weren't able to quickly jot them all down. Yes, I will be sending out the slides <coughs> along with the recording. So all of that will will be on there together, the video recording along with all of the sound. Um, and I can send out the slides as well, no problem. And I, I can't speak for others, but I can say that uh, this was extremely helpful and it answered all of my questions, which is why I have none for you now. But, but really, <laughs> uh, put in context not only, put in context I think what was most helpful for me is where um, where the dollars uh, w would be the most helpful, and where this, where strategic, inter where are the, which areas are most strategic as far as intervention. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we could also give you some some examples of uh, what the private sector, some private sector people have been doing. Um, uh, Lord Weidenfeld in, in London, for example, is uh, rescuing a thousand families. He's part of a group and evacuating them to Poland. And one of the member foundations of JFN, I won't name it because I haven't been uh, authorized to do that, but uh, they, they want to bring in Syrian agricultural workers and provide farming jobs and housing and transition services. Um, so those are just a couple of, exa a couple of additional examples. OK. So if there aren't any additional questions, um, I think we will close. If you do come up with anything, um, you can email me or Georgette. Are, are you, I can send any questions to Georgette, um, should there be any. And, and I, Janet, I saw your question about sending a list of organizations, so we will do that as well. And Georgette, maybe if there are any additional ones to the ones on the slides, Oh there, th oh, there are plenty. All fabulous. We want, so all we wanted to do was to give you a small sample. And great. Hello, so, Janet, and thank you for everything. Fabulous. So we'll be in touch. Um, afterwards, I'll, I'll make sure I get a more comprehensive list from Georgette and Shadi. And just thank you all for this fantastic call and for taking the time to learn about this important issue. And of course, uh, to Georgette and to Chadi for giving us such a thorough presentation that we actually don't have any, any questions other than how we can help. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon and a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.